right. Welcome, everyone. So if this is your first time here, fantastic. Basically, what we'll do is we go through our astronomy lecture for the day. Aim for half an hour usually ends up being about 40 minutes. And then uh, we cut off the recording. We'll just do kind of an AMA chat type thing if you've got any questions based on what we talked about or anything in general. Uh, we're more than welcome to chat about those. And uh, this week, <laughs> no, Bahana, you're good. Um, all right, so we are going to jump in with the formation of the solar system. So, oh, hi, Kuro. Nice to have you here. Last week, um, we talked about patterns that we see in the solar system. So we had talked about, you know, we broke down all the planets, and then we kind of went into a little bit about, like, how, you know, just observing it from the outside without necessarily having all those details that we know and love saying like, okay, well, they all orbit in the same direction. They all rotate in the same direction they orbit for the most part. Um, they all are in the same plane. There's four terrestrial planets, four Jovian planets. Then we have this like belt of asteroids and then this belt of comets on the outside. And then we have our Oort cloud. So we're talking about all these different types of um, patterns that we see. <laughs> and Pluto is a dwarf planet. I'm sorry, domestic, <laughs> not to call you out, <laughs> but you keep calling me out, so it works. Um, we have dwarf planets, we have asteroids, we have comets, all of those details, how they're distributed through our solar system. That's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. And then we talked about different ways to explore our solar system. So those being things like, um, you know, flyby missions, orbital missions, landers, rovers, uh, and then sample return missions. And we went through some examples. And if you didn't catch it last time, you would be able to, um, you should be able to see the VODs. I realized my toggle for my VODs was like um, set to subscribers only, which I didn't intend to do. So I apologize for that. Um, but if you've been looking for them before, you can find them now. And then also my YouTube link down below, you can find the recordings too. But we had so many adorable videos. There was lots of emotions last week. Lots of emotions. We're taking a step back from the emotions this week. <laughs> I mean, still beautiful, but less, um, you know, anthropomorphized, sad robots dying on comets. <laughs> um, all right. So what we're going to do is like we're trying to search for the origins of our solar system, not origins of like the universe or life. That's for other classes. Um, but this week we're talking about our search for the origin of our solar system specifically. Now, uh, the criteria that we need for this is that whatever method we come up with, with how our solar system was formed has to fit this specific criteria being, it has to account for the patterns of motions that we see. It has to account for these two categories of planets that we have. It has to account for this stupidly large number of asteroids and comets and where they are. So having the asteroids closer to the sun, the comets further away from the sun. And then it also has to allow for the exceptions that we find. So the things like, you know, Uranus is on its side and Venus orbits very slowly and backwards. Um, that we have moons that aren't necessarily in the same plane as the solar system and the bigger moons around their planet. So we have these exceptions that no matter what... Um, what model we come up with for how our solar system formed, they still have to meet this criteria as well. Okay, so this is something that, you know, people had studied for a long period of time and tried to come up with different hypotheses. Interestingly, um, Immanuel Kant came up with a lot of... Uh, he was almost like an astronomy philosopher. He was also one of the first people to come up with the concept of galaxies and just kind of talk about these clouds of stars that are distributed throughout our universe. Um, but in 1755, he proposed that our solar system was formed from the gravitational collapse of an interstellar cloud of gas. Now, recall when we were talking about Galileo and... Um, and then Kepler way back and, and Tycho Brahe and all those, there's an evolution to what we're going in. So now uh, we're sort of past Galileo-ish. We've got a lot more data. Now we're starting to actually question the stuff. We're using telescopes, albeit simple ones, but we're able to see a lot more of our solar system than we could with the naked eye. So Immanuel Kant came up with this idea that maybe this was a gravitational collapse of an interstellar cloud of gas. Uh, concurrently, independently, however you want, you know, around 40 years later, uh, Pierre-Simon Laplace in France suggested a similar hypothesis. Um, 
There was a hypothesis that came up in the 19th century, or actually the early 20th century, that said, what if, and this is a little bit bonkers, and I kind of like this, but what if the solar system formed from the close encounter of two stars passing each other and then pulling it apart and basically settling into there, which is kind of cool, and I kind of like it. Um, let me see. I was going to pull up a little more details on this one. Um, so the issue is, is that with this close encounter hypothesis that, um, it's been discarded basically because they could not account for the observed orbital motions of the planets, uh, or the neat division of planets into the terrestrial and Jovian. Um, and Bahana, when you mean steady state, do you mean like just kind of how our universe is all settled down possibly? Um, you know, we had this this close encounter idea is basically these two blobs pass by and then you pull all this material off of each star and then you settle into a solar system. But the main reason actually that this was discarded, not because it was hard to kind of model how the Jovian and terrestrial planets would have formed out of that, but uh, the likelihood of that happening is super low. And even more so, once we actually started to find star systems around other stars, we realized like there's no... Freaking! I mean, it had been discarded beyond that point, but that was just another nail in that coffin that there's no way that that, that could have been a possibility. But that was a, you know, but that was a hypothesis that was used for a long period of time. So then um, the nebular hypothesis started to kind of take a bit more hold. And it had kind of been in the background for a long period of time. Um, but it was basically that we were able to build better models. We have computing systems that are allowing us to um, see how this nebular hypothesis um Oh, Bahana, yeah. And then also, yeah, there's lots of <laughs> lots of aspects to that too. Um, that if our the steady state hypothesis, is that what you mean? Where it's like that our solar system has always been like that? I think, yeah, that was that's been that was discarded a long time as well when there was sort of this understanding that there may have been this evolution or or understanding that um our solar system had a beginning, that we're able to start dating things, doing radiometric dating um, and geology and realizing that our solar system has only been around for four and a half billion years. So, um, but yeah, excellent point. And uh, yeah, so this, so then the nebular hypothesis transformed into what we call the nebular theory. Now, way, way back at the beginning of this lecture series, we kind of talked about, you know, science and how the scientific method is difficult to apply in astronomy because we can't repeatedly test these theories in labs. So you have to have direct evidence of this. Um, so because of that, it's always going to be called the nebular theory, even if we're just like 100 Okay, as scientists, we should never say 100, but like 99.99999% sure that um, our universe came from this sort of idea of a nebular cloud that collapsed into a star system. Um, it's still always going to be called the nebular theory because we can't actually just do that experiment. We can build lots of great models for it, um, but we're never going to be able to experience experimentally prove that that's exactly how our solar system formed. It's the tricky part about being an astrophysicist. That's a whole like philosophical discussion on the scientific method that we don't have time to get into right now. We can discuss it later at the end if we want, but um, just to kind of clarify why it evolved from hypothesis to a theory, but not to like proof fact, I guess is the hard part. It's just part of the scientific method. Okay. So, then putting this nebular theory to the test, basically it passed all the important tests. It checked off, you know, why the star systems, um, why our star system settled out the way that it did. Um, hey, planetary, happy you're here. And, um, you know, that it claims that planets are an outgrowth of star formation process. Planetary systems are common and that we now have found that as well. Um, and, uh, like I said, this is the difficulty with astrophysics. We can't actually test this in a lab, but we can build highly sensitive numerical models that can allow us to get pretty, pretty close to this. Um, <laughs> yeah, Brad, exactly. We'll wait till the Romulan whiskey is passed around. Um, <laughs> and the Romulan ale. Uh, all right. So the challenge to this theory though, even though it holds up for our star system and it fits kind of what you know, if we build a numerical model of this and then settles out to where we were at, 
The issue is that we found other star systems that are arranged differently to ours, that we're finding larger planets near their stars, uh, closer to their stars. So jupiter size ish planets that are orbiting within, you know, weeks uh, or months or, you know, short periods of time around their stars. So not saying our solar system didn't form out of a nebula, but our understanding of that entire process is continually being tested and challenged for good reason. And this scientists keep an open mind about all of this. Um, and then the selection criteria I've touched on a couple times when we've had questions about exoplanets, planets that go around other stars. We've touched on this as like there is a selection criteria based on what we're able to definitively call a star system. But we are going to have at least an entire week, if not a couple of weeks, devoted to exoplanets. So we will get to all of those. I just want to put it out there that not all star systems that we're finding look exactly like ours, which is kind of this constant challenge that we have for, for balancing the two. So... Here's the theory about this solar nebula. I said, you know, nebular theory. Nebula really just means cloud in Latin. So uh, a solar nebula, we just are referring to this cloud from which our star system formed. Um, and it's a cyclical process. So stars and star systems are born out of clouds of gas and dust. As those stars go through their life cycle, they, they are fusing hy hydrogen into helium and then heavier elements from that. Once the star reaches the end of its life, it will either fizzle out and dissipate or it will supernova, it will explode. And then all that material is returned out to space when they die. And then that will be fed into other clouds of das dust and gas that are that will form new star systems. So it really is like the circle of life, as it were, <laughs> that we get there. And sorry for that earworm. But... That's uh, that's the cyclical process, and that's one of the interesting things that um, we can sort of reverse date our universe's process is looking at what the composition of our star is. Now, our star is 98% hydrogen and helium and 2% other stuff. That other stuff came from other stars that have gone through their life cycle and returned those heavier elements back to the universe that then condensed into our star system. Pretty cool. As Carl Sagan said, we are star stuff. So, um, and yes, note on this as well, uh, that spectroscopy, as we've touched on a lot so far, um, but spectroscopy, we're able to detect the specific elements. When we do spectroscopy on older stars in the universe, um, <laughs> There we go. Um, when we talk about other stars in the universe that we are able to see the younger stars that haven't been around as long, they have less proportions of heavier elements, if that makes sense. So they're starting more from like raw hydrogen and helium and then fuse those and return those back. So we're able to kind of look back in time, see that the younger stars don't have those heavier elements in them. So, um, and Bahana asked about Betelgeuse. Yes, it is still around. And I will add that to what we will talk about when we're done with this lecture. If I didn't, yeah, there's my pen. Okay. Um, all right. We'll talk about Betelgeuse. All right. Did I say it three times? Betelgeuse. All right. Now we're good. <laughs> okay. So going on from that, oops, this orderly pattern of motion that we can apply this gravitational collapse from a solar nebula um, that can result in the patterns of motions that we actually see. So as a, a solar nebula will shrink down in size due to gravity condensing it together, we have three processes that happen here. First of all, that nebula will start to heat up. And it's essentially because of the conservation of energy. We talked a little bit about this when we discussed gravity. Remember, all that stuff is coming back now. I promised all those weeks where we didn't get to do any space stuff and we had to learn a bunch of physics. This is why. We have our massive solar nebula that is big. And as it gravitationally collapses, all of that that actually converts from gravitational potential energy that gets converted to kinetic energy, which once they get really close to each other, you start to get that friction heat that comes from that. And that transfers to 
to thermal energy. So what I'm doing right now, as we all do when we're kids, and I bet at least three of you just did this as well. Um, when you start rubbing your hand sticks to each other, you get kinetic energy converted to thermal energy. So boom. Um, all right. And also friction. Uh, yeah. Physics. Uh, and also thank you. I as, I as <laughs> Sadiq, thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Um, okay. So then we have, uh, so that's the heating element as it condenses, we're converting gravitational potential to kinetic to thermal energy. Then we get a spinning, um, pattern of motion that we get here. So as the clouds are starting to collapse based on conservation of momentum, this cloud is going to start to rotate because it's getting smaller. There's some random motion associated with this, but they're hitting, you know, particles and it's starting to collapse down. And just like skaters when they're, I mean, it's a good comparison when their arms are out and they pull them in, they're going to start spinning faster because of conservation of angular momentum. Uh, that rotation speed is going to increase as your size gets smaller. And then the fact that it flattens out. And this is a little bit of a hard one. This is one that there's a lot of like misconceptions with. And even I've misspoken about this so many times just because of the way that we kind of picture it in our head. Um, but the flattening is a natural consequence that we get from collisions of particles in a spinning cloud. So you can start with like any size or shape um, and then they'll start to all rant, you know, these particles will be moving around at random speeds and random directions. Um, and then as they start to collide and merge as this cloud collapses, they start to like combine their velocities, right? So, so we talked about conservation of regular momentum. These clumps will attach to each other. Then you combine their velocities and their direction. So if they're coming randomly like this, then they're going to head off in that direction. Um, so you'll eventually start to get this flattening out. Um, and it becomes basically more orderly as the cloud collapses which is kind of counterintuitive. So um, you, it's a combination of everything that's going on here, but we do get this flattening as um, all of these particles are colliding with each other as it's collapsing. So the formation of this hot spinning disk basically explains most of the patterns of our solar system that we see. And then, uh, you know, the fact that we talked about as well, that the sun rotates in the same direction that all the planets orbit and most of the planets rotate in the same direction they're orbiting as well. That comes from this disc that's collapsing and then spinning as it's flattening out. So um, this is just kind of a, a image of we, what we have here. If I haven't hand gestured in enough or if you're <laughs> listening to this after the fact, um, all those random motions will start to uh, collide and then flatten it out as we go. Okay, so when we test this model, um, what we can, you know, came up with this model for nebula formation, um, started to get a little bit better hold in the 20th century when we were able to build computer models of these things and also start observing star forming nebula. So regions like the Orion Nebula and Orion's Belt is a star forming nebula, um, but it's like a giant cloud of gas and dust that has multiple star systems forming out of it. But we can see they start with clouds and then we get star systems. So I've used this analogy before, but like how in astrophysics, it's like putting puzzle pieces together. We have this theory for how our star system formed and now we can actually observe different star systems at different points in their life cycles. And that's exactly what we're able to see. Like I said as well, we can have detailed computer simulations. And then not to mention the fact that, you know, these flat spinning disks are also what we see how galaxies look and how rings around planets look. All of those kind of indicate that these processes are what happens in our solar system. <laughs> and, and we're back to the space wizards. <laughs> it's the brim of the space wizards hat. We'll go all, uh, we'll go all, you know, metaphorical with this here. I like it. All right. So how do we get two major types of planets? Um, this idea of condensation. So we have, <laughs> oh, that made me so happy. Um, all right. So now we kind of have our uh, flat spinning hot disc. We're good with that. 
where are the planets coming from? And why are there two major types of planets? Um, <laughs> so this idea of condensation, we talk about condensation in chemistry class. We understand it from a tactile visual standpoint where you can see clouds convert to rain, convert, you know, all of that. You get condensation outside of your glass when you have colds, uh, you know, the cold glass is attracting the gases that condense um, because of the different temperatures that we have. <laughs> Right. Also, hi, Dave. Um, the key here is that, and this analogy works well for me. If it doesn't work for you, then stick with me. But I do like this idea of the formation of snowflakes in clouds on Earth. If you know how snowflakes are formed, that can kind of help. It's the fact that you get these seeds, right? You start with crystals that condense out and then they start to grow. And that's kind of what happened with our solar system. But the key is, is that we have this literally nebula of dust and gas, and it's made up of different things. And those different con uh, compositions condense at different temperatures. <laughs> We're all space snowflakes. I like that. Um, and I'll talk about the frost line next, but um, if you can see it, okay. Sorry, the text isn't coming across super great. Um, but we basically have, you know, over here we have metals and uh, that would be things like iron, nickel, aluminum, and the condensation temperature for those are hot. So when they form into a solid, you're talking 1,000, 1,600 degrees Kelvin. So you'd have to be close to the central area for that to condense out because that's where the star, um, that's where our the heat from our star is. Oh, thanks for the follow, Malcolm. Uh, and then we get silicates. So we get rocks here. And then we get, so 500 to about 1300 degrees Kelvin. So a little bit further out, that's where you start to get that temperature. And then way further out, less than 500 degrees Kelvin, that's where you're getting water, um, water, methane, ammonia, hydrogen compounds that we talked about. That's where they start to freeze out. And then um, light gases, hydrogen and helium, those aren't going to condense in a nebula. And then this has the relative proportions of these that we are seeing from uh, within our our star system. So this is kind of the idea, right? That um, as when clouds form snowflakes, that's very temperature dependent. When those crystals are able to fall out and then able to, to grow from there. Similar process to what happens in our solar nebula. You have this hot spinning disk, but it's really hot near the center where most of that gas dust and gas is concentrated and it starts to dissipate further out that you get from the center. So that heat distribution that we're getting across the disk is dictating which materials are basically crystallizing uh, throughout the uh, throughout the disk. So the ones closer are going to be more like rocks and metals, and the ones further out are going to be more hydrogen compounds. That's where these snowflakes are starting to form, and then they'll eventually, you know, latch onto each other and grow and build up into uh, into planets. Space precipitate. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. I mentioned this frost line. This frost line is, um, and I want to make sure I, I define it properly. Uh, so the frost line is the distance at which it's cold enough for ices to condense. And again, we have this heat distribution. It's basically settling out. You can say the stars, if it's not a protostar, it's basically a star at this point. But we have our flat disk forming, and there's going to be a line you have that temperature going down as you're heading out, and there's going to be a line where ice will melt here, and it will be ice over here. And that's what we call the frost line. Typically used, you know, when we talk about our own temperature and environment here on Earth, but the frost line applies to the star system here. So within the frost line, you have rocks and metals that con are condensing, but hydrogen compounds like water or ice uh, are staying in a gas form. And then beyond the frost line, hydrogen compounds, rocks and metals condense. Now, um, so we're still talking about our solar nebula here. We're getting 98% uh, is still just hydrogen and helium gas that can't condense anywhere. It's going to stay in gas form. Uh, but because we have this frost line, and like I said, that distribution that's going out, that's where you get rocks and metals here, hydrogen compounds out here. And that border is essentially the asteroid belt. That's between Mars and Jupiter is where that frost line would fall. So uh, the terrestrial planets, you get this accretion that turns into 
planetesimals, tiny little planets, that will start to grow, and then we also get asteroids from that. The Jovian planets, basically you have these ice crystals that have started to fall out of the, um, of the nebula, and then gravity is starting to pull all of the other stuff together. Um, so the gravity is drawing the gas around these ice-rich planetesimals that are formed beyond the frost line. Um, okay, anything about there? So, yeah, I think we're good. Okay, so the star system has formed. We have these planetesimals. Think of them, too, as, like, we've gone from the snow snowflake analogy, we're going into the snowball analogy. You get a lot of snowflakes hanging out, they're going to start to clump together, and if they start falling, like gravity, they'll start to grow and accrete, and that's where you go from a planetesimal to a planet. At the same time, the center of the solar nebula is forming um, a star. So it's, like I said, it's getting hot and dense. It's the highest temperature that's in the center because all of that gravitational potential energy was converted to kinetic energy, which is thermal energy. And that star is getting hot and dense, super hot and super dense. And it's spinning fast. So we have this hot spinning ball of gas that's happening. And that's where in the center, you get this hydrogen that gets pushed together and fused into helium. That's when our star is born. Once hydrogen starts fusing into helium, the star is born and you've had this hot, dense ball that's been there. Um, what happens at that point then is that we get, you know, the solar wind, this radiation that's coming out from that process. So now it's not just the thermal heat that's happening, it's literal uh, radiation nuclear processes that are happening at the center that are emitting radiation that are then being sent out through our nebula. And that's what's kind of clearing out that central area of the leftover hydrogen and helium. That's just pushing it all away because it's... um because it's hot and there's a ton of solar wind and it's really, you know, this is still a very dynamic area. So it's, it's even more intense than it is now. And all that radiation pushes the hydrogen and helium away. And then it will go beyond the frost line and start condensing because it's beyond that frost line. So it starts to condense and gets pulled into Jupiter. So this is still, you know, it's, it's, it's important to remember that the sun and the planets are forming at the same time. And it's through these processes that we're getting that. So we're not saying that all the planets have completely borne out at this point once the star actually forms, but it's happening around the same time. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Aslan, that's a great analogy. It's the one friend of the party who loses their cool and everyone just starts backing away. Great analogy. I like that. <laughs> Um, okay, and it's important, too, to note that um, the magnetic field here is uh, a lot stronger than it was. So the young, uh, because we have this young star, it's spinning really fast, and it would be generating a much stronger magnetic field, which would lead to a much stronger solar wind and much stronger surface activity, which would cause high amounts of solar flares um, and emitting a lot of intense ultraviolet and x-ray radiation. So all of this is ionizing the gas um, and then pushing it out and uh, basically establishing the compositional fate of these. Oh, thank you, Rusty Skirt. I appreciate it. So like I said, push the hydrogen helium beyond the frost line, uh, you know, or it gets ionized and then it falls into uh, our rocks and metallic terrestrial planets in the middle or in the center, and then the Jovian planets on the outside. I think we're good. Awesome. Okay, asteroids and comets. Whoop, whoop. Uh, we love asteroids and comets. They're crazy. <laughs> uh, so remember, everything's still forming at this time. The planets are basically born out, but there's still a lot of rocks and dust and all of this stuff flying around. It's not, it's a, still a scary area to be hanging out in. And so we get a lot of bombardment. And the nice thing is, is that we can actually study this stuff. Um, Bahana, I'm coming back to that question. I'm not going to answer that right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Aslan, the moon had enough. <laughs> I like that. Um, all right, so... We're able to observe uh, asteroids and comets. The nice thing with asteroids and comets and why we send missions to them 
is because they're basically those leftover rocks from the formation of our solar system. As these, you know, little snowflakes were forming out, these are just the snowflakes that never made it into the snowball. <laughs> so if we want to see how the snowflakes were formed, we study them. Because the snowballs are now just a hot mess of whatever, you know, happened. Uh, but the original snowflakes, those are the ones that we want to study. And that's exactly what we're doing with the comets and the asteroids here. So that's uh, that's why we study them. That's why it's so important to study them. Um, but another thing, too, is that we're able to look at these rocky bodies in our star system that uh, don't have atmospheres that can allow us to study the impact craters. So we can kind of get a sense for, like, how long things have been bombarding the surfaces and then how... Um, you know, how big they were and how often it continues to happen. And no worries, I love it. And so uh, this period that I'm talking about, this heavy bombardment that's mentioned here, this is a very kind of specific period in our solar system's history. This is where the planets have borne out, but there's still a lot of rocks, asteroids, meteors, whatever, are flying around our solar system and running into things. And that's this period of heavy bombardment. Um, Bad stuff is happening and stuff is hitting all the things. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. Um, an important point as well is that now, if you were paying attention closely, you may have done a, wait a second, I'm not sure I caught that right. When we talked about the um, frost line and the hydrogen compounds and the rocks and metal in the inside and then the ice is on the outside, like, but we have ice and we have water and we even, I mean, we've talked about ice being on mercury in those Northern pole craters. So how did it, if it was within the frost line, where did that come from? And it's from this period of heavy bombardment. That's where we've seen that like all of these little planetesimals, these asteroids, these meteors are flying around our solar system running in. They're basically, you know, the solar system is starting to be fully formed at this point. But these rocks and stuff are flying around. They're crashing into the terrestrial rocky planets and basically depositing frozen ice. They're coming from the outside and coming in. And they're protected by the fact that they're now in a clumpy form. <laughs> and the planets that they're hitting are also in a clumpy form. And uh, so when they hit them, you know, they're able to, they're able to stay and they get embedded in those. So that's, that's an important point to note as well. But that's still something that is being studied. And that's why we have planetary geologists and why we study um, comets and meteors. So we can understand if that is exactly what happened. The models show that, but, uh, but we want to make sure. Okay. So uh, how do we explain these exceptions to the rules? Um, Remember, we, we talked about these ideas of captured moons that, you know, particularly Jupiter and Saturn, um, but we can also, to some extent, talk about Phobos and Deimos around Mars, that they don't fit in that flat orbit, um, that they're just kind of randomly going around Jupiter. You know, Jupiter formed, and then it has some bigger moons, these almost terrestrial-type moons, that uh, are all in a plane, but then there's a ton that aren't. And so where did they come from? <laughs> Aslan, I love it. Um, where did they come from? And it's this idea that they can be captured. So we have these captured moons that happen, but that's not easy. You know, we could talk about that from a gravitational standpoint and say, okay, so we have a planet, we have a little, you know, planetoid here that's coming by or a little asteroid or whatever that's flying by, it's, it's booking it and it's pulled in by the gravity, but it's got a lot of kinetic energy in its own right. So in order to actually get captured, it has to lose that orbital energy that it already had. And typically for that to happen, it's going to have to experience drag. So it's going to have to get close enough to experience some drag from the atmosphere to transfer its orbital energy and lose that to be able to get captured by that planet. But these gas giants are huge and they're giant. And so you don't have to get super, super close to it to be able to experience that drag. And that's how they get captured and, and flung into their, their orbits there. Um, <laughs> Andy, that's funny uh, about 
those moons. And to be fair, I mean, once we we talked about this a little bit last week too, but with Cassini and now Juno being at Saturn and Jupiter, they're able to actually see up and close how many objects are, are orbiting in regular periods would be considered moons. And there's a lot. There's a lot. So yeah, the uh, this capturing moons is possible, but it's tricky. And it's why we don't have, you know, half a dozen moons around us, even if they're just small like Phobos and Deimos. Uh, it's because they have to get close enough to actually lose their orbital energy um, close to it. Yeah, Cassini did the death dive. Cassini did the death dive, what, God, like four years ago? <laughs> Cassini. Three years ago, maybe? Okay, so the other one, Earth's moon. This is our favorite. We're going to talk a lot more about the uh, the geology of our moon and the evidence to this. But just to kind of lay the groundwork here, uh, it was a big old impact that happened, again, likely during this period of heavy bombardment. Because the Earth may not have been, like, fully formed yet. It's pretty much formed, but it's still pretty hot, and it's still a little bit unstable. And then an impact, likely the size of Mars, <laughs> big, hit Earth, tore a chunk off. That chunk is captured in the orbit, and it starts to you know, again, kind of coalesce, become a snowball and form into a moon around, uh, around the earth. Um, that's terrifying, <laughs> but, uh, but it also explains why we're tilted about 23 degrees. 23 degrees is not insignificant. So if earth was kind of happily formed here, something punches into it and tears off a big chunk, but that one that's left behind is kind of tilted a little on its side, and now we get the moon going around that. Um, it looks pretty good. So, um, what would have happened to the Earth if we had two or more moons surrounding Earth? That's a good, Do you mean captured or formed in a similar way? Because if it was formed in a similar way, I, you know, it would not be what we, we would not be standing on it, most likely, because, yeah. And yeah, it's moving slightly away from us. But, um, so the, the strong support, the strong evidence that we have for this giant impact hypothesis comes from two basic features of the moon's composition. Um, the first is that uh, the moon's composition is actually quite similar to Earth, so it kind of seems to have formed from the same stuff. And um, the second one is that uh, the moon has a smaller proportion of easily vaporized ingredients, <laughs> which is a little bit detailed here. Okay, so what if this, we're talking about this heavy bombardment, right? That's when a lot of these waters and ice are being delivered to the inner planets. Now, those are being delivered, Earth is formed, and another giant impact comes and hits it and tears off from it. Well, that giant impact that hit it, any any water, ice, or any sort of easily vaporized materials would be vaporized in that impact, and then it formed from that. And uh, and so the this lack of vape, uh, vaporized ingredients that are on the moon indicate that this likely formed from a high impact scenario as opposed to them falling out of the exact same cloud, this exact same nebula. Um, I agree, Aztalan. I mean, it's a, again, it's scales of time, right? It's scales of time that, you know, for us, a few generations seem like a long period of time. But when you're talking about billions of years or even hundreds of thousands of years, it's not that much. Um, but yeah, it is pretty cool. So planetary asks, do we still have that mini moon? Not sure what you're referencing. Maybe? I feel like there's something in the back of my brain where I knew about this. Um, and then, yes, by one. That's, yes, agreed. So water on the moon. We have found water, ice of some form, um, compounds, not that much. Um, but yes, then the water, the frozen ice would have had to have got there after the formation. And that's why 
That's why it's still worth-ish. It's not high priority, but it's still worth studying the moon just because we can actually look at those impact craters. Because it has hardly any atmosphere, we can look at those impact craters and see how long they were and see what kind of things were deposited to try to account for the time scale of everything. So yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Um, yeah, captured satellites versus moons. There's, there's like a super gray line right there. Um, but yeah, that was a great question. I appreciate that. All right. And like I said, we're going to talk a lot more about the moon when we get into the geology of our planetary system. So other exceptions here that, um, are most likely that are most likely due to the heavy bombardment, high impact events. The fact that Mercury's core extends about to 80, what is it? 85% of its radius. So, you know, we have our core, then we have our mantle, which is a big part. Then we have our, our crust, loosely. Mercury has, like, a core and then a little crust. <laughs> and so the question is, is, like, during this bombardment, Mercury may have been blasted and blew a lot of the outside layers away from it. Um, and uh, it could also have explained why Uranus is on its side. Massive impact tipped it on its side. And then... Another one is why Venus is slow and in backwards rotation orbit, that it's basically pummeled it, slowed it down, and actually ended up reversing it. <laughs> no, sorry, Andy, it's not liquid, it's solid. So I'm talking about the solid iron, not the magma portion of it, but just literally solid, uh, solid metal in its center uh, goes to 85% of its entire radius. So yeah, thank you for the clarification. Um, how do we know about Mercury's core? That's a great question. So we can do, we can do some level of radar imaging um, that can go to that like slightly subsurface level. Um, and we can also look at impact craters. So we can also do um, active scanning where we probe the surface and see what comes back. And so you can have these impact craters that run pretty deep and we're able to see that too. But I don't have a specific experiment that I can point to, but I will put that on the uh, to-do list because that's a that's a great question. Um, how do we know about Mercury's core? And we can look that up too once we're done here. We're almost done. Um, all right. And yes. Awesome. All right. So just to summarize, um, we're going to go through what this formation of the solar system was in, in detail. So we have this huge, diffuse interstellar gas cloud um, that's starting to contract. As it's contracting, the cloud starts to heat, flatten, and spin, which is becoming a hot spinning disk of dust and gas. Sun's at the center. Planets are starting to form in the disk. <laughs> As the one. Solid. All right, now that disk... We move that up. Now going from that, we're starting to get the condensation of solid particles. Hydrogen and helium are staying in gas form, but other materials are starting to seed out based on how far away they are from the core. Um, so the warm temperatures are only allowing for metal rock seeds to condense. And then further out this frost line, we're getting these um, seeds to becoming more hydrogen compounds, um, methane, water, uh, ammonia, those sort of things. Then from as those seeds are going, we're starting to get our, what we call the accretion of planetesimals. But these planetesimals are just those seeds that have now started to accrete and grow bigger. Um, those are starting to continue growing and they're starting to collide and sticking together. The larger ones are attracting others with their gravity and are growing much bigger. Um, we're getting the terrestrial planets that are built out of metal and rock. And then the seeds of Jovian planets are big enough to start attracting hydrogen and helium gas, making them into giant, mostly gaseous planets. And then moons that form out of the dust and gas below that. Um, thank you, Atronax. That's a good question, Bahana. Um, most likely not because Mars is within, Mars is actually within the frost line. So it has a similar, we think, composition to Earth because that core, that's what that seed, let me just go back. Uh, yeah, the core, that's where those seeds are coming from. And so because Mars is, Mars is within the frost line, it will have been seeded from rock and metal, not ices. Now, yes, uh, we have discovered subsurface temperature on, uh, or subsurface water on Mars, but, uh, that would likely have been from, you know, it's long history, 
but would have been delivered there from the heavy bombardment of other particles. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, so we're getting the terrestrial planets are being built from metal and rock. Jovian planets are attracting hydrogen and helium. And then skipping down from that, we have uh, the sun forms and we get that solar wind is blowing out the remaining gas into interstellar space and beyond. Uh, the terrestrial planets are still in the core. Jovian planets are in the outside. And then we have these leftovers that become asteroids and comets. So, and this is not to scale. <laughs> Just to go with that. All right, so that's it for this. Uh, next time, we're going to be talking about how we know the age of the solar system. We're going to be talking a little bit about the planetary interior, so I will definitely have a question, uh, or I will have an answer to Mercury's core question there, uh, as well as the, the 1989 disappointment with Mars, um, and then how the planetary surfaces are formed. So we're mostly going to be focusing on planetary geology of the terrestrial planets next week. Um, so with that, I will stop the recording. I will be staying on the live stream, but if you're watching this after the fact on YouTube, feel free to like, subscribe, do all those things, and you can find links down below, and we do this live on Twitch uh, Fridays at 1 p.m. Pacific time. So thank you for watching, and we will catch you next time. Mm -hmm.